my hope is, is that my comments today, which are going to be basically grounded, of course, in the therapeutic community approach, but that my comments to you will be relevant to what you're doing. And I'm, I just wanted to say up front that I respect that there are people who are probably doing things, different things in different places with different populations, and it may not be obvious right away in terms of what's the therapeutic community contribution to that, but uh, I hope you will see that it, it, it is obvious. And the second part of uh, my kind of introductory comments to this is, has to do with uh, another lesson I've learned, which is I never really assume now when I come to a particular setting that everybody uniformly has a, an experience or a good understanding of the therapeutic community as an approach. So um, part of our time together, at least the first, maybe the first half hour or more, essentially is really what I want to do is go over with you what you, what you need to know about the therapeutic community, what the actual approach is. And then from there, we can get to some of the special issues that may relate to the work that you're doing. But we can't get there unless we have an agreement on the fun some fundamental information about the therapeutic community so that we're all on the same page as to what we're really talking about. If that isn't too audacious. And third, I also I apologize for the fact that I'm dressed informally. Uh, some of you aren't. Most of you are okay, you know, so I feel with you on this. But, uh, you know, I try over the years, um, you know, academic dress has always been uh, a symbol of uh, a socialization. <coughs> and so I never wanted my dress to get in the way of the way of the message. So even though I'm informally dressed, don't let that distract you from the message, you know, I mean, whatever that message is going to be. Look. The, if you go back to early 1960, we had a raging opiate epidemic. There have been several over the past hundred years epidemics. And um, the, ther the therapeutic community approach was born in an epidemic. Uh, I say that now because I'm also rehearsing some contemporary ideas because we, of course, today we have another opiate epidemic in, 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 this, uh, in, in this year. And there's an, uh, a, even a question has been raised, what is the role of the therapeutic community in the current opiate epidemic? So the phrase I open with is, the TC merged in an epidemic. And the important point about that, we're talking around 1958 to begin with Synanon in the early 1960s. The important part about that statement is, is that there were no uh, effective and demonstrated treatments for people who had substance abuse problems. Many of them, of course, had criminal histories and criminal lifestyles. And the association between substance abuse and criminality has always been very highly correlated, very close. But the key point about this is that uh, we had no um, approaches, no treatments, no adequate responses beyond brief periods of detoxification in specialized hospital settings for substance abuse, opiate abuses. Now, that was a fact, you know, from from the mid-50s to the early 60s. The therapeutic communities emerged in that climate. And, and the important point about that is, it was the, the TC, or that approach, was essentially was developed by the participants themselves. So it didn't come from, let's say, mental health, and it didn't come from the medical field. It didn't come from specialists. The approach actually began with the first generation of participants themselves. Now, why that's very important is, is that here you have an approach 
that was gradually being developed by the very people who needed something to help them change their lives. Of course, this mainstream approaches, mental health and medical approaches, psychological approaches, were not relevant. So it was being cultivated and developed by the people themselves. So we, in simple language, say, we say it's like a self-help approach or a mutual self-help approach. And it is in that sense. But it's larger than that. Because what they were learning uh, in those early days is that there was no outside help for what they were doing. That the standard medical approach of detoxification was insufficient because you had a 93% relapse rate within 30 days of uh, leaving a detox. And that the only way they would change is, if, in fact, if they somehow developed a process for changing themselves. And of course, that process meant changing themselves, mean somehow uh, I use you to change me, you use uh, me to change you. So this is a, this is a fact, it's not poetry. So that first fact led to a very rapid spawning of a number of places, particularly in the East, programs that were beginning to flourish. And all of those programs were colonized. They were seeded by people who had been in that kind of a program. So you'd be... You were in one program, you might graduate that program, and then, or you might even drop out from that program, and then find yourself helping assist and launch another program. Really, a, a true self-help approach, or mutual self-help approach. And in my writings, I've always called it, you know, in the, in the early days it was seen as an alternative to mainstream approaches. Out on the margins of society, because they also, also many of its, much of its resident population might have been considered out on the margins of, of society. But here they were in their own laboratory cultivating an approach 24 hours, seven days a week, and watch out for maybe three, four years. So when you think of a six month program or a nine month program, relative to the history, the history said they were in it for years. And there's a good reason why they discovered why it had to be years. Because ultimately what they were really trying to do is not simply get off drugs or stop crime or getting, you know. It was, as they were beginning to discover, really learning how to live their lives totally in a different way. Later on, I felt that that needed to be, you needed language for that. That's why I, began, I talk about the therapeutic community ultimate goals as being lifestyle and identity change. So their objective was much larger than simply stop using drugs and stop using crime. That was essential, of course. You had to stop all that. But that's the beginning of the change process. Stopping using drugs, stopping criminal behavior was the beginning of a change, not the end. And the word beginning, of course, has a lot of implication. It means that going forward, we're going to be doing a lot of things which have to do with changing who we are and how we live. The reason that is important, and I guess today some of the volume is going up now. He was asking me about volume. Some of the volume is going up now, right? The reason why this idea of change beyond the target behavior, drug use or crime, but change beyond that, is because we were really talking about individuals who were trying to now learn how to live life on life's terms in a way that was healthy and productive. And that required, you know, overcoming, passing through ancient history of your own trauma, your own misbehavior, your own psychological distress, transformations.
The reason why that uh, I emphasize that and why the volume goes up is because it's very different from other approaches in that respect. Pharmacological approaches, for example, for substance abuse were sensible. They were, you know, they were trying to somehow stop people from killing themselves, overdosing. Like today, we have that overdose issue. They were trying to get people to stop killing themselves. And, and so those approaches, the pharmacological approaches, were more like reducing injury, reducing harm. And that's sensible. You want to save lives, of course. But of course, that's at the same time, it's a very different goal than the larger lifestyle change and identity change. That distinction is very important because in your work, you immediately have to at least understand that difference. Today, in our, in our society, and of course we have, a, we have an evolved drug treatment system, we have an evolved correctional system, we got these systems, you know, uh, converge in many ways in, in dealing with certain target populations. It comes down to then what's the goal of this program? So that 50-year-old message that I just talked about ultimately translates in looking, re-looking at, well, what's, if we have a six-month program, a 12-month program, a one-year program, what's the actual goal of the program? They were saying, without it, back then, 50 and 60 years ago, they were saying, in their own way, in different ways, that the goal was to learn how to live differently, and that's one of the reasons we had to, we came together in community, like this community here, to help each other learn how to live differently. And in some sense, we don't know when that was accomplished, in terms of what's the target date for that. You know, you don't graduate from a process which is involved in learning how to live differently. Now, again, I'm not in any way denigrating the, the importance of programs, short-term programs, long-term programs, because every program is at least trying to help an individual initiate some kind of change in their lives. Every program, if it's, if it's a valid program, is trying to do that. And I don't know which kinds of programs you're all working in, long-term programs, short-term re-entry programs, uh, various kinds of mental health programs, and so on. But if you want to understand the therapeutic community, it began, as I mentioned, uh, in terms of the participants themselves, and ultimately what it essentially understood is that they were in the business of bringing about transformational change. Lifetime, lifestyle changes, which means not only behaviors, attitudes, managing emotions, but it also means values, how to live, why we should live right, and ultimately identity changes. How I see myself, how I label myself, how society sees me, how they label me. You're an addict, you're an ex-addict, those are labels. You're a convict, you're an ex-convict. You're a felon, those are, late, those are identity labels. All of that had to change. Big, it's a big menu, big order to do. So in those early days, when I got involved in the, one of the first therapeutic communities in New York, a place called Phoenix House in New York, as a psychologist, I had been very uh, trained and well-trained on the issues of helping people, you know, feel better in life, not be as depressed, not be as anxious, function better. And those are worthy, worthy goals. But what, what I saw in those first days in Phoenix House, I saw people who were essentially on a daily basis kind of uh, looking in, they were in the process of transformational change. I, I talked about the way I was dressed today. I have a little guilt about that, I'll tell you why. In those early days, we had all of the residents in Phoenix House, and most of those TCs. The men, they were co-ed programs. The men were dressed with shirts and ties. 
Uh, these are guys that have been ripping and running out on the street and living essentially marginal lives. But you walked into the program, and unlike a clinic or a mental hospital or a prison, the residents in those programs were dressed in shirts, the men were dressed in shirts and ties, the women were appropriately dressed. From day one, and of course, the idea there right away was to the immediate message to the to the new resident coming in was your life is going to change, and the first way you make a change like that is you dress like who you want to be, not who you've been, which is the foundational concept of act as if. I don't know if you know that concept in there, but it's act as if. But that's that concept. You walk and talk the person that you think you want to be rather than who you've been. I'm not doing that today, you can see. But so that's part of the guilt and the apology. But so you got it, and I'm not going to overdo that point. <laughs> so look. I just wanted to give you, if I could, a kind of an entertaining introduction on the origins, the first origins of the TC. But why did it persist 50, 60 years later? Why did it ultimately have a tremendous impact on the correctional system? That is, not only did it begin with substance abusers out in the community, but very fairly quickly became applied to many different populations in many different settings, including, of course, the criminal justice system, the correctional system, the mental health system, the shelter system, the adolescent system. Because it was such a powerful a phenomenon, somehow a community approach to changing large numbers of people, and even though the target issue might have been different, mental health issue in some cases, uh, adolescent problems in other cases, or crime and criminal lifestyle in other cases. The whole idea of using something like a community approach found very quickly found its impact in these, in these other populations in these other settings. What generated the message for the advance of the therapeutic community, which you've now, some of you now have inherited 50, 60 years later in your, in your work, is that the research that we were able to do in the early days uh, essentially played a role in advancing the whole approach. The, the key question was that even though it begins as an alternative approach, alternative to mainstream mental health and medicine, even though it begins with marginal populations, very difficult, in many cases, very difficult to treat in other ways. The approach, when we finally did some of the eva first evaluation studies, which was some of the role that I played in some of my colleagues, I want to pause here for a moment because I want to tell you why I played that role. I came, of course, they asked me to help as a psychologist in those first days, but I immediately saw that they didn't need a psychologist. That is not, they didn't need my psychological skills in that. Because it, it was the community, and we're going to come back, of course, to the whole title of this. It was because it was the community that was the basic method that was going on there. So they didn't really need a traditional psychologist or psychiatrist. They didn't, that is, they didn't those, need those skills. So I said, the only way I can help this community is to study it. And not only that, but to see if we can demonstrate whether and how it's working. So that they couldn't do for themselves. And that's, that's a role that I could play. So that's the parenthesis around you know, why I got in early on into the evaluation of that, because the approach itself did not need me as a clinical, classical, or a professional in a sense. That's a message that's going to come back to today because there are many of you who have been trained in your own sub-professions and it comes back when you're talking about therapeutic community or using a community or TC-like approach, it always re-raises the question of, well, what is the role of the traditional professional, social worker, counselor, and so on, physician, when basically the method is going to be the community and not the individual provider? We'll come back to that. 
So we did the evaluation studies, and of course, here's the second point now, this is the second learning point. First one I made, I hope you got it, which is how this began and who, who developed it, participants themselves. The second one now is, does it work? So as, as participants in the field, whether you're a resident or a student in this field or a faculty person or staff person, I'm using synonyms now, you need to have this information about, if, to be informed by this information. What do we know about the effectiveness of the therapeutic community? Does it work? And those early studies, we looked at individuals who were moving through places like Phoenix House, and they often would be there two and two and a half years in that program before they left. And then followed them out one, two, three, five, in some cases, seven and 12 years after treatment. And see how they're doing. Are they committing crimes? Are they using drugs? Are they, are they, just, are they disturbed? Are they? On the other hand, are they paying taxes? Are they working? Are they raising their families? Are they pursuing themselves? So we looked at all of the dimensions of what we think is, what do we mean by lifestyle change and what do we mean by identity change? And then we were able to get at a concept of success that these individuals could be called successful if they, you didn't see any evidence of any crime, any evidence of drug use, and they were working, paying taxes. And, and so we were able to describe a profile of success. And then as a result of that, we can also then talk about success rates. What percentage of people were successful? So here's the main finding, and it's of course, it turns out to be a universal finding. That's one of the reasons you need to understand it in, in your own work. And that is, if those individuals completed actually, around 24 months, 18 to 24 months of intensive involvement in a therapeutic community, which incidentally, not all of that needed to be in the residence, but, but about uh, 18 months of that of residence and then six months of non-residence, but still heavily involved in the process. If you actually completed that, what we found was the success rates by the definition I just outlined a, little, a moment ago, the sex, success rates were around 80%. For those who would not be considered successful, it means there may have been some use of uh, some drug use or there might have been some, uh, uh, there might have been a, an incident of arrest or a conviction and so on. So that's what non-success would be. But they were also considerably, considerably improved people, even if they weren't classified as successful. But, so that was a very, very powerful number. When I first did my own studies and saw those kinds of numbers, 75 and 80 percent, two, three, and four years after treatment, and I wound up doing some of those interviews myself because you, you had to find people. You would find people not only in, in the United States, but I went to France and went to England to find former Phoenix people. Some of them, one or two of them had been dropouts. I'm going to come back to that in a moment to really see what was happening to them. So these were very striking numbers, or kind of hard to believe. Well, there was a kind of uh, reservation around this, and it was this. Yes, if you were really, uh, in quotes, a kind of graduate or completer of this approach, that's the kind of success rate you can have, but most people didn't complete. The rule was dropout, not graduation. So you can have 100 people walking through the door, you know what I mean, and a year later, maybe only 30 or 35% of those completed, you know what I mean, uh, a year of that program. So the reservation, the hedge around all of this was is that you can have dramatic success in terms of the science formulation of this, but it really depended upon completing or, as we now found out, in the large number of dropouts, that is those who did not complete, we looked at how long they had been here in the particular program. Well, how much time did they complete? 
And we were able to show a direct relationship between how long they had been in the program and what percentage of them would be successful. And of course, graduates were the best success, 75% and 80%. But we found that even people who had completed 12 to 15 months but didn't finish the program, their success rates were around 60% and so on. And then if they completed 10 months, it went down to 40%. It looked like a kind of, uh, from a pharmacological point of view, a kind of dose response curve. You know, the more, the higher the dose that you had of the treatment, the greater the likelihood you'd be successful. But there really looks like the critical number was a year to show a measurable change. That rule, as a matter of fact, that finding which became a rule is is a rule in the in the entire drug treatment business. The longer, the greater the dosage of treatment, the greater the out, the better the outcomes. In non-pharmacological treatments. So look, that's the second piece of information. And this, uh, this first 20 minutes is just information sharing for you. That you need to understand. That the approach was developed by the participants themselves. And when you ask the question about whether it works, the answer is, is you get success rates which are directly related to how long you've been there. And it looks like it's a long-term treatment approach uh, to bring about success rates. Now look, one of the important conclusions that had, that comes out of that work is it began to open up our understanding about recovery, what it takes for individuals to change to a point where their change is a really stable change in their lives and they're now living differently and they're no longer living at risk. And what we've been able to now understand from those kinds of studies over the years is the process of change itself and understanding that that probably can be discussed in terms of stages. And that ultimately brings us back to here and now and the kinds of treatments we're doing, the work that you're doing. The goals of the approach, where that individual is in that change process and being able to evaluate that and then, and here's the main message, whatever we're doing, whatever work you're doing, is it work which is designed to move the individual to that next stage of change in their life? But for the moment, I just want to check to make sure that you're still awake and also to hear, get some, get some immediate questions if you have them. In other words, there might be questions of clarification. I don't want to go too long without checking on whether you're okay in terms of what you're hearing. So we'll take a little, so we're not going to go into long narratives now or long commentaries, but just some questions that you might have, some needs for clarification, please. The 80% success rate, that included the 30%, the 30 who completed, not the overall dropout. Or was that right? The, the, that 80% rate is on those who complete the, the treatment. But the rest of the dropouts, the success rates, were directly related to how long they stayed in treatment. So sometimes the research over the years has delivered numbers which would look at the entire program, so you would get like a 43% success rate for the entire program, but you've got to break that out in terms of the dosage, you know what I mean? When, when you look at the dosage, you can see those who completed got a high success rate, and those who did and so on. So those are the numbers in that, but it's a good question. I'm glad you asked it, and I hope it's clear. Good. When you're looking at, let's say, a year to 18 months, would not somebody who was in an in-prison therapeutic community that went from the in-prison therapeutic community directly to a community-based therapeutic community, not back out on the main population, where there was a continuity of relationship, would not that ultimately, one hopes, have be able to pull down those kinds of success rates? If there was, again, I'm emphasizing continuity of relationship. Yeah. Um, 
because there's like even this morning we had a really great situation where somebody who worked at Lancaster came and met some you know David and I don't know if you've seen him yet but you know where there's that continuity of relationship from behind walls to the street which validates things. Uh, the research I just described to you was the kind of classical research on community-based therapeutic communities for substance abusers about 70% of them had also criminal histories in, in those substances, even though they were in community-based TCs. When we moved into the criminal justice system and began to actually introduce therapeutic communities in prisons as the, as the first component, uh, the next step for them is when they leave, which starts to get close to the issues of reentry and so on, but when they're gonna separate from the prison, uh, the next step for them, what we then, when these first started, when we brought it into the prisons, I was going to, this was the second part of the lecture, but coming into the prisons, it meant establishing in the prison-based TC a project which, as close as possible, duplicated what we learned and, and was able to produce in the community-based TC. Because that's what the science said, that that's what you should do. So that first year was a prison-based TC behind the walls. And then uh, for those that were going to then leave, we knew it, it would not be enough. That it was going to need, at least from the, as it's, all the research had shown, the optimal number would be at least another year uh, of intensive involvement, but in this case, outside the walls. The research that we did on those first prison TCs, including Amity itself, showed that. When we finally did it that way, that was the right way to do it. That is, that they completed a year behind the walls, and then also essentially completed another year, or close to a year, outside the walls, uh, you get your best outcomes. In fact, the way we have written about it is you, you reconstitute the time and program. That's what you're really doing. You're just breaking it up between behind the walls and then post wall. That raised the whole, everything we learned about prison-based, correctional-based TCs centered on this idea of how do we keep individuals who at least begin their process in the prison setting, how do we keep them in that process? Uh, and essentially also give them the opportunity to get out of prison but stay in the process. Because all the science said, look, if, 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 they, if, they get out of pro, if they get out of prison, we know there's such a tremendous push and rush for individuals to simply be free and, and get out and, and go on in their lives. They don't want to even be in programs after that. We understand that. And I'm going to come back. This is a big issue to talk about if we get enough time today about, you know, what are the real singular challenges of the, of the uh, TC approach for clients in, uh, in the prison and correctional settings, this is one of them, which is how do you keep them, or the major one, how do you keep them in the process long enough so they get the full impact of, of the, uh, what we'll call the dose? So yes, your answer is yes, and the science shows that. As the, in, in, in the prison-based studies, we, we got the same outcomes, same outcomes. They did a year, if they did a year behind the walls in a TC, and did six to 12 months in a post-prison TC-oriented setting, they, 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 their success rates were quite similar. So again, that may be the old one of the, that's, a, that's of course another key message that I wanted you to get this morning about what did we learn about from the research in prison-based TCs. That will bring us to even more difficult questions I think we should have if I've been reading these two days right, which is what do you do with, given what we now know, what do you do with the issues of uh, individuals who are coming out of prison and going into reentry programs and might not have had any prison-based TC treatment, much less prison-based TC treatment, knowing that everything we know now about dose and time and treatment as the main factor. This, this is one of the critical questions that comes up for particularly reentry settings. We'll, we'll come back to that. I realize that that's a, that's, a, that's a complex question, but I think I have a few things to say about it. But, but again, I'm just in a pause for the moment to check again some other questions or uh, clarifications. 
Over here? They enter and they come through the, the, the program and that the, those that leave, once they leave the program, continue to be about some type of rehabilitating are less likely to go back to drugs or relapse. It's the, the main fact is if individuals who are continuing in any kind of bona fide uh, rehabilitation, but the, the word they use, I'm, I'm not sure I like the word, but it's aftercare, but it, this is the one they talked about. Any aftercare is better than no aftercare, but the most po potent and reliable effects are as if an individual leaves, let's say, a prison-based TC and goes into a community-based TC, that essentially increases the likelihood that you get your best effects on that one. But any, any continuation in uh, attempts to stay in the rehabilitation mode, whether you're using whatever variety of bona fide aftercare services, AANA, so all of that, all that would be helpful. That's better than zero. We should keep the individual somewhat in the process. But the optimal approach has been essentially, for, at least in the prison-based studies, is to move individuals into a TC-oriented aftercare after that. And then we got to talk about what that program, because that program should look like what I would call a very sophisticated kind of re-entry program. We have to come back to that discussion, what that program should really look like. But, but that, uh, that's, that's the key point about it. So it's a good question. Right? Once they leave the TC uh, communities um, post wall, does this mean that uh, they're more likely to be employable? Um, substance abuse, obviously. Um, what does that mean for society as as an uh, individual changes comes along? We know right. That's the, that translate in terms of like everyday language. That turns translates into like what's the cost benefits of, of you know all of this. And we know that's the, one of the ways TCs sell themselves, which is the fact is that we, we produce stable long-term outcomes, people going to work, people paying taxes, people preventing future drug use in terms of their own family situation, uh, what we call collateral benefits on this. So they're terrific positive payoffs for society. And you know, I've set up TC programs for seriously mentally ill substance abusers, and there there are big costs because you have the whole mental health costs and so on, but by showing that you can produce significant changes in those people, first their substance abuse stops, and, as a result, and also you begin to see changes in a lot of other their psychological issues, their cost savings are even more dramatic. You know, you less rehospitalization, less medication, less suicide, so on. All of that, uh, so there are tremendous society benefits when individuals begin to make these, what I would call these long-term changes in this. Aside now, what's the benefit for the individual? But, but certainly the benefit uh, for society is very clear. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes. Good. When we talk about change beyond the target behavior. Right. Um, okay, there's some obvious behaviors. Uh, that ended me up in prison. Um, but we do a lot of these uh, assessments nowadays that kind of are formatted to address psychosocial behaviors. Right. Um, in the early TCs, how were those behaviors identified versus behaviors that are identified on this legitimate assessment? Some of the psychosocial assessments um, that we use today, like the Compass or, or some of the other assessments, the tools that we have, um, um, show us the um, tendencies for an individual to go back and commit crime, or show us the propensity for an individual to go back and use drugs, mm -hmm. or whatever it is, violence. And so it's like, okay, when I'm doing a treatment plan, I'm trying to treat that behavior based on this assessment. Mm. So how am, how were those behaviors identified in the early TC? Because there was no assessment, right? There were no um, formal um, psychiatrists or anything of that nature. It was just community as medicine, mm. people helping each other. How were those behaviors identified? Okay, so okay, I think I thank you for the clarification yeah. on that. Well, first, uh, uh, 
a, a qualification on the qualification, and that is we did do those assessments. Oh, you did? Yeah, we did. Okay. But remember that, uh, and we would firstly, what that broke down to, what those assessments meant as follows. When we began to do the first outcome studies, a, an important line of research was when you finally defined a success or a non-success or a dropout or an early dropout or a later dropout, you then had to look at what might be many of the social psychological factors that might correlate with that. So that told us right away, you know what I mean, who was a higher risk, lower risk, medium risk person. But we had much sounder data, which we, we had done the follow-up studies, and we were able to now understand that information on the basis of who actually was successful out there, who had dropped out, was less successful, who was not doing well, and were able to relate, relate it back to what social psychological assessments we had. We, when we did those early follow-up studies, we had actually a lot of social psychological assessments. So the early work was able to establish risk factors for individuals in, in that sense. But nothing replaced the fact that if the individual stayed in treatment, those risk factors became much, much less important. What was really important was the fact is that these individuals stayed and they, they might have come in very disturbed people, high risk people. But if they stayed and went through the process and in going through that process, during their stay in the process, the community was strong enough to help the individual see what might actually be those risk factors. Then those risk factors changed. We had some, in fact, the, the social psychological profiles of the clients then, back then in early TCs, and even today, are the poorest in all of the, uh, the, uh, the drug treatment literature and the criminal treatment literature. Their profile, we have the poorest clients. TCs are seeing as the treatment of last resort. Uh, because they've got the, the most troubled histories, not only their drug use, but their crime use and, and other kinds of traumatic histories and so on. So TCs have been most potent because they are treating the most severe profile. That's one of the ways we talked about it. And, and, the, reason, and the reason why it's important to emphasize is that if community as method is working, it is getting at those issues. And that's time correlated. You don't get at those issues in three months. You don't get at them in, 20, in 28 days. You know what I mean? You're going to take, it's going to take time to be in the, in the program long enough so gradually, that's why the, the drug issues may stop while you're there. They don't use drugs while they're in the program. They're not committing crimes while they're in the program. What are they doing? Well, what, what's happening is, is now the way they are living on a 24-7 basis with each other is beginning to reveal a lot of the issues of their lives. You get that opportunity to address those issues. That's the heart of the change process. Are you with me on this? Yeah. So it's a great question and a very important question. Yes. For those that were upfront about their needs from the get-go, because again, some of the needs might come out through their through their communication and therapy and so on. So, like, once you know somebody needs more, um, like they're they're more intense, more more of a level than what their immediate group can give them. How how do you then figure out? how to assist that individual in a community <coughs> setting without like excluding them? Of course, because we're not, but how to give them exactly the level of service that they need. It might be a question for discussion, but I, I, I want to do three minutes on that. Could you give me an example of what you're talking about? So let's say an individual has came from the justice system, of course, um, repeated since you know, foster home, abuse family, right. and so on, sexual abuse, and, and then that comes up. Sexual abuse, repeated, you know, repeated circumstances, then they are then becoming the abuser, um, and so on. And then as time goes on, it right. just kind of then becomes into an anger issue, substance abuse, mm -hmm. coping, denial, you know? So that could fit a lot of people, but then, of course, People are not always going to disclose all of that up front. They're mm -hmm. going to say this is what happened, that's it, as they become more, uh, I guess, used to the group and, and confident into like, what they can disclose is not going to get outside of the group and right. reveal a little bit more. Right. And so how do you then keep providing them services without you know, feeling them as though they're being held hostage to a treatment? I don't know well, 
I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to do it in a historical way for the moment. In a, in a kind of classical community as method, therapeutic community approach, uh, over 80 or 90 percent of our clients had all of those problems. So there was nothing new about traumatic histories, disturbed histories, violence or anything. Nothing new about that. That, that always was there. In a classical TC, that process of increase sitting in groups, sharing, right? That process, which is an incremental process, was directly related to the issues that you are concerned about, which is individuals having more and more trust, feeling safer, physically, psychologically safe, and increasingly living with the same cadre of brothers and sisters in their program, 24-7, hearing other people disclose a, a very important primary intervention in helping people disclose is to hear other people disclose. Over time, time, six, eight, nine months, many of those, those profound damage, trauma issues, if you like, those, those profound issues, get an opportunity now to undergo a public disclosure that is in the group, and then finally at the healing effects begin showing from there. That is the reason why we began to see and understand the long-term recovery outcomes. If they didn't go through those experiences, they were less likely to have a stable long-term recovery outcome. That's one of the, re and all of that was time correlated. So we were able to easily estimate, you know, if somebody dropped out at five months, not likely that they got to any of those issues. But if they've been around here nine, 12 months, and not only that, we had a public recordings of people in groups that, I mean, records that we knew they were attending groups, things were happening to them they were more likely to undergo the actual interventional effects, which is really being in, with, in other, with other people in circles of people and disclosing their issues. This is one of the unfortunate liabilities. Where are you working now? Here. Here? So what's the, what's, what's the planned duration of treatment here? It's anywhere from what I've seen is the longest, I think, like almost a year and a half. Year and a half? Uh -huh. One way you can, and then you got something a lot shorter, right? Yeah, so one way you can begin thinking about this is that, yes, if A, do we have a program that's more like community as method? We'll come back again to see what those elements really are. B, are the individuals in here long enough so they can essentially get exposed to community as method at, at the dosage that we want? So your questions become much more answerable in this way. What I want to reassure you of is that the TC success as a long-term recovery program, changing lifestyles and identities, was directly dependent upon time and treatment, and time itself was necessary so that individuals can essentially begin to uh, undergo this, the psychological changes that you're, you're interested in. The reason why you may have get discouraged around this, people working in the way you're working, if we're working in programs where, let's say, plan durations of treatments are three months, four months, or six months, you're not likely to see any of that. Uh, if you're working in programs that are not really community as method programs, but are strictly focused on their drugs or their crimes, uh, then you're not likely to see any of that. And so that's the reason you, you could start to raise, get frustrated, as you are, get frustrated around, you know, well, how do you bring about all of these changes? That's the, that's the main point in my uh, giving you the research on this, and then as we talk about, well, what's community as method, what's the right approach, and is it being practiced properly, uh, you can begin to get, I think, the answers that you need to your questions. The takeaway message, in case I'm talking too much, on your question is, is that TCs, when they're operating at high fidelity, that is doing what they're supposed to be doing, community as method, with the appropriate amount of time, ultimately get to these in, important historical, traumatic, ancient histories of suffering, and say that people uh, begin to get into. And that, in their having those experiences are the predictors of whether they're going to have long-term recovery or not. But if they walk out the door and they haven't gotten there, uh, they're still at risk. Today in California, we'll get a guy uh, for five months, 
and they go back to the yard and do their duration of five years or explain that you are running okay. an in-prison TC. Oh, in prison TC, in they prison, go back to the pop. Is that they mean? go back to the pop and you know I chased them down. I fought for three years to get mentors that were not, you know, paid <laughs> for a long time and they this was a group of five they would only give me five gentlemen. And there are uh, four of them, two of them came here, two of them went down to Vista, and one is waiting for a date, and they'll be gone. And I'm already fighting, the, well, why do we need more? Because they were the ones that were really in the buildings, building the relationships, and making a difference, and they're asked about every day. Um, how do we, and I, I know this is a, how do we legitimize how important relationships are of treating people like human beings to people who are not trained or that's not their uh, mission. You know, their mission is to keep them, hmm. you know, <laughs> kind well, of set. And I, I want to be, of course, uh, uh, frank with you on this. If it's the one, if it's the issue I, I think you're raising, which is in, in some correctional settings, um, there may be TC programs that have been launched, TC-oriented programs that have been launched, but individuals uh, could finish that program before they finish their time and go back to the POP. That is a policy, aside from wrong or right, but po that is a policy which contradicts the science of what we do. So when I had to go back to various states, whether it was New Jersey or Texas and so on, and talk about planning for uh, therapeutic communities in prisons. And the original model of therapeutic communities in prisons was always for people who were targeted to leave. They were going to end their time in prison uh, in a program, in a TC program. So as not, of course, to deal with this, uh, this awful issue of you're going to go now go back to the population <coughs> because it undoes all, all of the work. So that's a policy issue, and I appreciate your frustration around that. We can't solve it here, but it is a policy issue, uh, which has to do with if you're going to have a bona fide therapeutic community approach in a prison setting, it should be designed the way it was originally proposed for correctional settings and where we got all the good outcome results, which is it, it's essentially clients who are targeted for their parole within two years and so on, and they're going to do their last periods of time here, and then they're going to leave, and they're going to go into some reentry aftercare in the TC. That's the idealized approach. If you're struggling with a, a, in a setting where they, you can't do that, uh, you're in a very, very uphill climb, you understand? But uh, the only thing you can, and I, I always try to help anyway, but, but in some ways, as, as I, it's probably my geriatric problems now, but as I get, <laughs> but I always say, well, you know, uh, we, have, we had the cases in Alabama where guys were not getting out, right, in the, in like that. Yeah, and, and you, there are some miraculous ways where these, some of those individuals can find usefulness and purpo purpose in their lives going back to the pop as missionaries themselves, you understand, in terms of, of trying to change people. That's one way to try to use them. So it's building up, it's building up a missionary cadre of self. You're going back into the trenches now. You're going to go back in. You can either take a dive in your own life and, or somehow try to see if you, can, you yourself can start transforming people out there. It's the best word you can get on this, is how do you use people who are going to go back into the pop and give them some purpose in life. But actually, my druthers is like, we got to change the policy. If you're going to do this right, uh, and we might, we might set up for, for people who have to be there for life, there are important, I think, contributions that TC can make for their lives in terms of making the quality of their lives in the prison much better. There's certainly a future for that. Does that help? I know. Yeah. OK. I push that. You know, I have that um, were going to be mentors and they say well what book do I need to learn what do I need to read how do I need to tell them what to do and I would say build a relationship with them know their kids names you know know the cut you know that's being a mentor you know? that's a training issue not a teaching issue today today's session is a teaching session it's not a training session so yes I did 40 years in prison straight and um, I was always moderate I think today, the Board of Prison Terms, today they're letting a lot of moderate prisoners out today. Moderate. Yeah, because of groups, <coughs> like, like you, you were speaking on, 
that Amity has, when they get out, they go to places like this, they got it. And I think the board of prison terms are finding, find, are, are, are starting to find out that there's places for us now. You know, and um, they're overlooking the high risk, moderate, and low risk now. Because years ago, they used to do only, you had to get to low risk to, to try to get out, right? <coughs> Today, out of the prison system behind the walls, they're letting a lot of moderate lifers go now mm -hmm. because they went to groups and stuff. And um, I think they're starting to notice too, like uh, foundations like Amity and other places are helping, like you spoke on, that are helping us uh, get our lives right and, and get our stuff together and, and our maturity and growth mm -hmm. and all that and to get back out when we do leave these foundations. Do you have any suggestions as to uh, what we should focus on as far as, you know, the, the, the guys that are really here 30 to 60 days so that, you know, they have a, a, a definite you know, some kind of uh, way to success or, you know. So tell me more about these days, so 30 to 60, what's the program? Tell me the program. Uh, right here, Amistad. Yeah, and at Amistad, and just to be that subset of people who are only referred to 60 yeah, sometimes, days. Yeah, sometimes, you know, they come to finish their, their, their tail end of their sentence, and some of them are coming with 30 to 45 days, sometimes, you know, around that and it, it's it's really uh, hard to, you know, dosage wise. If everything is time related, what do we do with, with, with 30 days, 40 days, 50 days? So here we are, look, I want to get on record again so that you know, I don't seem too naive to you. If I had full political druthers, if I had my own power on this, I know and others like me know how we're supposed to set this up how it can work, because we know the science has validated how it works and why. We know that. You're now dealing in the trenches with all of the political issues that uh, exist in terms of different states having different approaches to this and what they're going to provide. So you're dealing with a tremendous problem. And at times, I've got to tell you, and I just, I may need a group now, but I'm going to at least disclose some things, that, how I've grown dark around this myself, because when I've seen these changes in the field and these kinds of political issues giving us only 30 days, 45 days, and they're asking us to write a recovery check in 45 days. It's ridiculous. So I understand this. So I'm going to just say something that may be at least help you, hopefully help you in terms of your education. If I've got somebody for 30 or 40 days, I've got two questions. One is, I don't want too many of them. If they are, if they exceed a certain percentage of our resident population, they're a threat to the whole community. They can undermine the whole community. That has to be stopped. That's like, that's, you, you, you don't tolerate that. You, you, if you have to accept some short stairs, it's got to be within some percentage parameters because it undermines the, can undermine the very program you're trying to implement. So that's the first political statement. I, and I always take that stand and people, and, and then the particular policy or the prison will moderate, you know, in terms of understand what's involved. But then finally, if even within the threshold, 10% of the population is short stayers, let's say, you know, and they're obviously now they've got a different menu than the rest of the population. I got that. She so said, what can you do on that? Now, there's no magic on this, but here's the thinking. I have no idea what, who these individuals are, how much they've changed, how much they want to change, right? We don't any of that. So one of the activities is to really find all of that out which is if I got somebody in here for 30 days, I'm gonna like treat them as if they were a one-on-one -on -one client of mine. You know, they walked in the door and I'm gonna find out through several strategies, and we'll talk about that, I wanna find out whether these individuals uh, are interested in all, at all in the change process. I wanna find out whether, what their histories have been to establish maybe some kind of risk assessment, you know, how far are they gone in terms of what has changed. I want to find out in more narrow language, do they have any motivation for changing in that sense. So you could ask, and this is again, this, this part now is a training issue, but you, as a first response to your question, begin thinking about what it is 
that we can possibly do for somebody who walked in the door and here's having a cup of coffee with us and then, and then leaving, what can we give them? Well, one way is this way, which is if I find out whether they have any interest in the change process, then there are things to talk to them about, which is uh, what, they, what steps they may have to take even though they're now leaving here to continue in that change process. You may find that half of them have no interest in change. You know what I mean? They don't, in fact, they don't even think they've got a problem. You know what I mean? So you, know, you may find that. So the issue there is, OK, remember, always keep something in mind. If they're in a change-oriented program like our program, and you're not interested in changing, and I can't get you out of here because of policy, then if you're not going to follow and you're not going to lead, then step on the side, then stay a, put on, get on the side. You don't want them to be a problem in the, in the community. So the issue is, you, and with respect, you can tell them that. I've, I've had guys that are not interested in being here. They were saying that they didn't want to be here. They sent me here for whatever, but you know, they had their, and the issue was, I first would explore with them what's possible. Is there anything in your life that you think you want to work on? Maybe you can make some suggestions that we can go from here. But if they're not interested, then the main measure is, with respect, then we just hope you don't get in the way here in this, in this program. So take each one of them, do a careful assessment about what, how they've changed, why they got here, whether they have any interest in changing when they're leaving, do they have any realistic plans about that. In doing that, having that kind of an interchange, you're already providing a service for them in terms of laying out you know, some ways that they should be thinking about themselves. Does this make any sense? Yes. Please. Maybe 16 to 18 months before I bought into the prison TC. Yeah. Uh, how do we get guys to buy into the prison TC within a five-month period of time. You mean if I've got a max of five months? Yes. Well, now you're beginning again to come back to the kinds of frustrations that an old man feels. You understand? I got This is what they keep asking us to do. You know what I mean? I want you to do a double retinal surgery, you understand that? With a scissor. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you got five months, right? So, to, to buy in, you know. And the whole program is five months. All right. I've been living now for two decades, and a number of us have been living in the field, have been living with this idea of reduced plan durations of treatment, whether it's in prisons or whether it's in community-based TCs, six-month programs, four-month programs, for people who need really at least a two-year, three-year involvement. You know. So here's the key on this. We now know that the single characteristic of clients that relates to buying into a program, committing to a program, participating in a program, the single characteristic that we can identify that seems to be relevant to that is a word you all know, and it's the word motivation. Motivation means an individual who is motivated means they have, they recognize that I have a problem. The problem is me. The problem is me. A, and then the second part of the motivation, and I want to change it. So when I want to explore motivation with individuals, I'm always looking at, does this individual recognize and accept that they have a problem. Not, not simply drug use. They begin with that first problem. I have a drug use problem. Within 10 days, they should be able to begin enunciating whether they have other problems. So that's the problem recognition side of it. That's, I don't need five months for that. I can get that, I can get that within 30 days. Individuals beginning to recognize and or accept that they have a problem. Other than their drugs that they've got, or in addition to their drugs and crime. B, are you interested in changing? Does this matter to you that you have this problem? That's a big part of the motivational issue. Not only seeing who I've been, but is there any part of me that wants to change who I've been? Are you with me so far? That dimension of motivation is essentially something we can work on 
in short periods of time. So when I get either a 30 or 40 day person to come in here, I can design a little mini program around helping individuals come to this point of either recognizing, accepting, and wanting to change, or declaring I don't. And even individuals are saying, I, I have problems, and I don't want to change. Or I don't have problems, and I'm not interested in changing anything. So A, I, I would begin tailoring some of the programmatic activities. I can have a motivational group, which is essentially only centered around problem recognition, problem recognition, problem acceptance. That's not the end of it, though. Because we know that the second dimension of motivation is a word called readiness. And the word readiness means I got a problem, I don't like it, and I do want to change, but I've had a lot of people who essentially say they're not ready to do it. So they may even say all this. They may say, you know, I, I, I see my life and I don't like it, but I'm not ready to do it. You see this a lot in addiction, you know what I mean? They're not, they're not ready to do it. That's the readiness issue. So one other activity is when I not only want to establish whether they're motivated, but how far along are they in terms of readiness for change. So watch, if I've got six months and I wanted to lay out a six month program, I would never lay out a six month program which would say the outcome of this program is going to be recovery. I'd never write that check. I don't tell out to policy people. When people say you would do a program, I don't, don't ask me for a six-month program that's going to produce long-term recovery. Forget that. But I could develop a six-month program, watch it now, that could in fact maybe produce outcomes which have to do with individuals moving along the recovery stages to a point where they, when they leave this program, they are actually now ready and motivated to do something else. I was able to establish some of those programs to do that. In fact, because prison treatment and prison TCs in general have kind of, uh, they've been kind of weakening over the years, when I now go to even a 12-month prison TC around the country and do a similar lecture to, to, always to the residents, you know, the, the staff are relatively minor in these lectures, I always, I always want to do it with the residents, what, what I want them to hear is, by the time you're finished here at 12 months, if you leave here actually ready to go to treatment, you've gained a lot. They're already leaving here thinking, you know what I mean? I'm ready to now just go out in life and case closed. I'm gonna be on the fly from here on out. So that in effect, it's a valuable and important outcome to get an individual to a point where they begin to fully accept that they have a real problem and they begin to develop some commitment that they want to change it, even though your program time has run out. And so that the next stop for you, essentially, at least you are in a position to be guided as, well, what are my next steps? Now that I think I, I've got a problem, now that I think I want to change. And as we were talking yesterday, and I hope you're here today, even in the recovery process at 12 months or 18 months, I want our people in that process to keep recognizing I've got to stay in this process. I've got to stay in this process, using the world to help me change. And that essentially is, minimizes all, most of the risk that occurs there. So in a five-month period, it's not so much buy-in, but I understand what you mean by the buy-in issue. The, the real target is to really get people to see if they're motivated and, and ready to change. And we can talk about, here's a training issue rather than a teaching issue, how would I modify the program that focuses on the issues of motivation and readiness? And we can, we can talk about that. But when I've got a year and a half, the buy-in will occur around six months or seven months. In your case, it occurred around a year and a half. Yeah. That the longest period of time, most people stayed 45 days. And we had this terrible, like, what are you going to do in 45 days? And I, we had some research and we were measuring what was going on. And of the 45-day group, 60% of them got highly motivated enough to continue with some kind of help somewhere. It wasn't necessarily empty, yeah. but over a seven-year period of time of that group that Regina worked with on that particular team, um, we, had, we had that. Now, that was a team of some TC practitioners that already had a lot of depth, yeah. already had worked um, in the field, and we, every single one of those people was expert at motivating the unmotivated <laughs> on this hand, and also very good at boundaries on the other. 
And what was interesting about it was that of the women that were, because it was a coeducational jail project, of the women that participated in that, of those women that did continue with Amity, where there was um, continuity of relationship, not just a continuity of service, 100% right. of them, three years post Amity, had never been rearrested. Yeah. And so it really speaks to that, that continuity of relationship and then you know, not saying to people, well, if you, if you don't get well and you're not all done in five months or 45 days, then you're a failure. Because that's what starts happening. People think that in five months they're supposed to have this transformative, and it's not yeah. fair to tell people that. That's right. But it is fair to say, we can get you ready. Yeah. We can get you kick-started. But then you got to pick up that ball. You know, you got to put on the back that. That, that is the theme. That's the, that's the theme. And it's the only, it's the, it's the one I responded to when I saw in terms of the politics of treatment that support for long-term treatment was going down. They weren't going to essentially support long-term one and a half, two-year programs. They were going to send people in for 40 days and 30 days and so on. And what is, what, how potentially damaging that policy was. And so one kind of adaptation to that was to change the goals and say, you know, we'll, We'll have different goals, and the different goals is somehow getting ready and um, and uh, helping the individual identify th the problems in their lives and see if we can if they can take the next step when they leave here. It's the best we can do under that. But I, you know, my druthers is to we should be doing it right. In all the years I've been doing this, over 50 years now, the one thing that is consistent for people who stay in this field is they want to make a difference, okay? And the frustration is primarily when you feel you can't make a difference, or you're not making enough of a difference. That's, and I heard some of that this morning, you know, like we have policies in place that frustrate our intent. But that's something we have to deal with. You know, we, we, you know nothing's perfect. We, we do the very, very best we can. But the value of having George here uh, is because uh, of almost all the people I know, and I know people all over the world who are involved in this field, and people, uh, many people over the years who've done a lot of work in therapeutic communities and many other modalities. There are some things that we actually know that make a difference. Some of the things George is talking about, time in treatment, you know, is really something that is, it's not speculation, it's a reality. You know, we can't get people to change their identity, you know, and their lifestyle in three months. It just isn't going to happen, you know. Uh, just like you can't plant a tree and have fruit on it in three months. I mean, it. It, there's a there's a a process that must occur uh, that takes some time. However, it's not just time; it's also intensity. And the intensity is how well we do our jobs, how well we really engage with people. Do we know them? Do we know their story? Do we know about their kids? Do we know about the things they've done well and the things they've done badly? Do we know about the things that they're frightened of and the things that they're excited about? Do we know the names of the people in their lives? Do we know the anniversary dates? Because a lot of people get hit by that anniversary date. Gee, funny, every October, Billy Bob ends up, you know, end up back in the, in, in the county jail again. Well, what happened in October, okay? Well, that's when his mother had a drug overdose, or that's when, you know, uh, he lost his dad at two years old. Or so, you know, so for us, we not only have to have time, because sometimes we have enough time to really do a good job, and sometimes we're, 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 we're fighting against those policy changes. But always, always, we can make the, the process very intense by really knowing our people, getting to know them. If we don't know them, no matter how great the tools are, they don't work very well. 
because then they seem kind of phony and inauthentic. We're trying to put you through a process, but we don't know your, we don't even know your name. We don't know where you live. We don't know where you came from. We don't know what institutions you were in. Okay? And if we don't know that stuff, this really doesn't work very well. If we, if we do that basic process, and then we take the things that George has, has extracted from that process that he observed for so many years, all the basic elements of the TC, then we got something that really works really, really well. And that's what we want, all of us. All of us want to make that difference in people's lives. So that's, the, that's why I'm, I'm always excited to have George here because he always has, this time we talked a lot about identity change. Why do you need that time after prison? Because you can't change your identity in a prison. You can become a good prisoner, but you can't become a good citizen when you're incarcerated, right? So you need that time in community to change your identity to become a good citizen, right? So, you know, it, it all makes sense. George? <laughs> we began our discussion by saying therapeutic communities. And you can see that's a descriptive statement. It says, you know, there are communities which produce therapeutic effects. That's what the, the term therapeutic communities mean. Using a community to produce a therapeutic effect. Community as method, that phrase, is a more modern phrase. Right? The word method begins to reintroduce the idea like there are other methods for producing therapeutic change, pharmacological methods, um, uh, cognitive behavioral strategy methods, psychological methods that are involved in producing change. And I have to share this with you in my mission to bring the therapeutic community, help the therapeutic, therapeutic community come into the mainstream and gained full acceptance through research, uh, I knew, as some others have known, it would be very limited and difficult to do that if we still somehow communicated the therapeutic community as some exotic place where people you know, undergo important uh, experiences and we can't understand them unless you live through them. Uh, of course, uh, in many ways it makes the thing therapeutic community seem still alternative and still very strange. Doesn't look like medicine, doesn't look like conventional mental health. So as part of the strategy to continue to get even research funding to basically study the therapeutic community, I had to convince uh, the government and others that this was a bona fide method. It was, it was, a, it was a method like uh, methanol maintenance is a method as a treatment method. It happens to be a pharmacological method. Ours happens to be, and then I'll come to this phrase in another, another explanation in a moment. So I wanted to introduce the term method for the purposes of centralizing the TC into mainstream that is as complex as this approach was, involving whole communities of people, sharing themselves, operating in job functions, essentially uh, using every, and I'll come to this definition in a moment, every activity to help themselves change, I, this complex approach, community, still, in spite of its complexity, there was a method to this mess. That is, and that meant, uh, essentially, even though it's going to be very difficult to study it, maybe even to elucidate it, spell it out, that's going to be difficult, but it was nevertheless a method. And, and so that's really the history behind the phrase community as method. In the early days, 1940s, there were therapeutic communities in England. They were for psychiatric patients. Uh, but that phrase, therapeutic communities, was used for psychiatric patients. They didn't use the word community as method. But there were one or two books out where you saw the title as community as healer, community as doctor. Uh, and so there, too, was a similar historical example of the kind of issue that I was grappling with. How do you somehow, in a brief phrase, communicate to a particular audience what this approach is? And so um, to capture the TC, and you, I believe, if, no matter where you work, 
uh, in, in, in your work in terms of whether you work in therapeutic communities, you work in other uh, kinds of uh, human services. There's something profound to learn in your work from this discussion of community as method and recovery process in general. I think you, it's good for all human services workers to understand that. If you get a good grasp of community as method, uh, it can help guide you even in some of your own work as a, as a, uh, a faculty person, as a provider, as a staff person, as a correctional officer. I think you, you can learn something from this. So what is community as method? There's a definition that will, will help you on this. If a community is a method, it would be defined as follows. We, the community, the community itself, let's say we're the community, we will teach, teach you, the individual, how to use us, we, the community, to change yourself. We'll do it again. Take it, you know, one more time, as Count Basie would say. One more time. We, the community, will teach the individual to use the community to change themselves. In the last analysis, the output of the therapeutic community is the individual, it's not the community. What's supposed to come out of all this in the end is the individual has changed in a meaningful way. And you notice that this definition that I just gave you shows you the relationship between the individual and the community. The individual is learning how to use everything in this environment, the physical environment as well as the psychological environment, how to use all relationships, all activities, groups, meetings, job functions, individual one-on-one -on -one relationships, how do we use every one of those elements and activities in this environment to learn, learn about and change ourselves. That's a very idealized, it's correct, but it's an idealized approach to a definition to understanding the therapeutic community. So everything we're doing in a therapeutic community should be, ideally, if you're doing it right, teaching the individual about how they can learn about themselves by doing what they're doing, whether they are sitting talking in a group, whether they're participating in a meeting, whether they're holding themselves accountable in job functions and so on. And we can break down every one of the activities and elements in the therapeutic community in terms of what is the therapeutic and or educational effect of that activity on the individual. We do everything in the therapeutic community with a purpose. So it's very, very powerful from, from that point of view. Just think, you know, I've got 80 people in a program. That's the other great virtue of a therapeutic community. You can treat a lot of people at the same time. That's one of the great advances over, let's say, one-on-one -on -one therapy. Here we're using, we take 80 people and train them in such a way where 80 people are helping 80 people change 80 people. That caught my fascination very early because I saw that in my grandiosity as a way of changing the world. You know, you can change the world. So, yeah, and, and that's... I still, I'm still holding on to that, but now at this stage it's probably delusional, I understand that. But you'll give me a little slack, you know? <laughs> so if a therapeutic community is really a method, the community itself sets the standards of participation, will teach you how you should participate. The community itself will be constantly following you in terms of whether you are meeting those expectations for participation. Community is not only uh, the, sets the standards for how you should participate, but will you continually meet the expectations of those of the community. So that's constantly the issue of now observing, feedback, correcting, affirming, that's what, the, that's what the, we're doing. 
And we do that by mutual agreement. Do this for me. I do it for you, you do it for me. The community will continue then react to their own evaluation of whether you are meeting expectations. That's why if we sit you down in an encounter group and talk to you about some behaviors and attitudes that you haven't changed, what the community is telling you in that format is how your behavior and attitudes affect other people. I want to pause on that because this is another kind of human service principle that you really have to understand. This is one of the, I think, one of the really genius elements of the, of the Third City community. The use, when we say we're using the community, you're using the community to change yourself. That's an example of it. We sit you down in an encounter group, you have three or four peers or residents or students talking to you about some behaviors and attitudes and how those behaviors and attitudes affect, the word is affect, not effect. The word affect means produce feelings in us. That's what the word affect means. How your behaviors and attitudes produce feelings in us. Right. Now why, why do I emphasize that? Why is that potentially so powerful? Well, the first thing is it's, it gives the individual, in terms of if I'm gonna learn about myself, and I mean it, one way I can really learn about myself is absolutely listen to how other people are experiencing how I walk and talk. There's no other therapy that I know of that does that. That's simple reality. You know, you look at all conventional therapies, if you have a one-on-one -on -one counselor, the one-on-one -on -one counselors, that's not their role. If they get into a vision of telling you how you affect them, they lose their counseling position. They can't do that properly. We understand that. There's a place for counseling. We understand that when that's when that could be used in the world. But here in the therapeutic community, we're saying your the, the reactions of my peers are telling me my impact on them, what I produce in terms of their feelings, whether they get threatened by me, whether they get angry with me, whether they get disappointed by me, whether they get saddened by me, whether they get enjoyment from me. So why am I fussing about this? Because when you think in simple psychotherapy or behavioral change terms, you have potentially one of the most efficient means of bringing that about. An individual begins to hear about their behaviors and attitudes through the reactions of other people. So you can walk through a program with 85 other people in there, and you've got the benefit of hearing how you are impacting people, because in listening to that, you increase the likelihood that you will raise your awareness as to how you are impacting people in the world. One of the reasons therapeutic communities learned the whole encounter process as a special example of that was is that the clients, the people themselves, the peers themselves, they never listened to anybody. In the earliest days, the issue was, you know, whether they would listen to parents, whether they listen, whether they listen to teachers, whether they listen to police. The whole issue, one of the central issues of our clients is that they could not, they were not, and remained insensitive in terms of their awareness of what their impact was on other people. That's one of the reasons we should start to make diagnoses of sociopathy and so on. They, didn't, they seemed to have no guilt, they didn't seem to have empathy, they didn't seem to relate to that. That all comes back to this fundamental kind of uh, essential element of, the, of them, which is do I have an awareness of how I affect other people? Without that awareness, I can't have empathy, I can't have sympathy, and with all restraining and inhibitor factors in our lives. This is a very, very powerful element of the therapeutic, in many ways, the most powerful element. When we're using other people to help raise our awareness about how we are affecting other people. Then you've got the, the, uh, got the other side of it. Am I essentially, essentially telling, telling other people also how their behaviors and attitudes affect me. So you, when you, you got, to, got two skills to learn in these groups. 
You gotta listen, that's one skill, so I make sure I get what I, I'm supposed to get out of this group to hear how people are, see me and, and, and uh, respond to me. And I have to have an opportunity to talk to people about how they affect me. So awareness is, has two dimensions to it. My awareness of how I affect others and my awareness of how others are affecting me. And that form of group process, which gets its kind of most efficient execution, it occurs in, the, in a well-run, in quotes, let's say, encounter group, uh, and where it's specially designed to do that. We're going to sit, we're going to talk with you in a way where, and the whole objective is to simply raise your awareness. And the way we want to raise that is by the accumulative response of other people on how they see you and how they react to you. And that's why I use this word affect, produce feelings. So you're not, you're not doing psychotherapy in those groups. You're not sitting there interpreting their behavior and telling them how they even should behave. The, the, the real data that they need is they need to hear, we need to hear, I need to hear how my behaviors and attitudes produce feelings in you. That's why you start to get feeling expressions in, in those groups. I'm angry with you, I'm afraid with you, I worry about you, I'm concerned about you. The other feature about that exchange is we know that a lot of our people that we work with, students, clients, convicts, drug addicts, whatever, a lot of the people that we work with, their awareness is not likely to be raised unless they actually feel the feelings of other people. So you sit there as a psychotherapist and say, you know, well, that kind of behavior, you know, is, it, it can disturb other people. That's, that's a very lightweight statement to make to somebody. It's, and very different from your brother or sister sitting across the room and telling you how, how afraid he or she can get when you, in fact, behave in a certain way. So the use of affect, feelings, emotions, to uh, raise awareness is an essential and valid psychological intervention. I, I get louder on this because we've had a years of a skepticism in, in our field around what they call confrontation, confrontation groups. A lot of conventional, a lot of conventional uh, human services workers resent those groups. They, they have trouble with those kinds of groups. They're often groups that are seen as intense, sometimes loud, people think that they're threatening, some, and sometimes that can happen. That's a particular issue in correctional TCs. We'll come back to that and why the, the whole issues of psychological and physical safety needs to be understood. You know, it's one thing for groups to get loud and be perfectly self-managed, but be expressing, you know what I mean, authentic behaviors and feelings in that group, and be perfectly self-managed so that there's no, there's no threats at all. And we know under the rules of a good therapeutic community, you cannot threaten this, as a matter of fact. We literally basically put that in place because we have to have complete physical and psychological safety if people are going to honestly express what they need to express. And we say, by our theory, if they don't get to the point where they can express what they need to express, they're not going to change in a very profound way. This is the simple kind of logic to all of this. We've got to be able to get to the full humanity of our situation. That may mean how we express feelings and yet be safe in doing that. I point this out particularly for those who are working in correctional settings. We've had, that was a limitation in many of those correctional setting TCs. You know, and understandably because the correctional settings are dedicated to security and safety and that's right, that's what their job is. So you can't criticize that. The, the real evolutionary challenge of TCs in correctional settings was to get them to see that there was absolute safety. If it's a well-run program, the program will manage itself and it'll be safe, physically and psychologically safe, and capable, therefore, of helping individuals get into the essentially psychological material they've got to get into. We're talking about community as method, and uh, one, the, the pause that I, I went into, I was able to talk to you a little bit about confrontation, which I wanted to get in. I managed, I think, to sneak it in there, but the, it was at the point where the community, the third component of community as a method is it not only sets the standards of how you participate, follows whether you're really doing that, and then essentially uh, will confront you on uh, whether you are or not, maybe give you consequences to whether you're doing it or not. They'll tell you 
and the group process is one of the settings in which we do that uh, in terms of giving the individual the feedback in meaningful ways. So look, what th the summary of this last five minutes is all you're hearing is when, you, when we say community is method, we say that everything the individual is going to learn about themselves, they're going to learn about that through uh, their activities, relationships in the therapeutic community. And it's going to be the, um, the simple arrangement is community has expectations about how you should participate. And the fundamental outcome of all of that is to get to the conclusion that we know something now fundamental about long-term recovery and long-term change. If you participate, then you will change. And that means, you know, we'll set those standards, we'll watch whether you're doing it, we'll give you the feedback, positive and negative, about whether you're doing that, all in the direction of essentially increasing your participation to change. This is the, uh, in the last analysis when we finally say, what's the active ingredient in communities method? That is, why do people change and how do they change? And that is, they change because they participate, even when they don't want to participate. Even if essentially their feelings are against it, the concept of act as if it should do it anyway. Not to be a punitive statement, but to say, if you will do something, if you will change, even if essentially you uh, act as if you're changing, even if you don't believe it. You don't have to believe it. We, we often tell people, you don't have to believe this. You don't even have to accept it, just do it. The reason for that is, is what we now know, if you continue to do it, you will then see whether you change or not. You yourself will get to a point where you can decide whether I've changed or not. So in the end, it's not tyranny. It is a strategy and a tool that the, 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 we teach each other in the TC. Just do it and see for yourself. And we do know, of course, when we finally again go back to the science on this, just to back up some of these statements, the issue is, is that when individuals have to participate, this comes back to the issue of buying in, they inevitably get to a point in their treatment experience, in their experience in the program, if they've been participating, that they buy in. It's because they begin to experience, at some level, valid personal change. Something has changed. And that's the element of, in the buy-in. Sometimes you're fully conscious of what that was that changed. Sometimes it's not as clear for you. But that buy-in, even though it may look like a moment in life, is actually the result of cumulative small actual changes. For example, in drug programs, you'd be surprised how many first admissions, if they've been there for 30 days, would say they hadn't been clean for 30 days in, 30, in 15 years. They would have never believed that they could essentially somehow uh, get clean, and all of a sudden, with no, with no, desoc no methadone or anything like that, for 30 days, they'd say they realize they've been clean for 30 days. That first change, it's one of the reasons, incidentally, the 30 days is a very, very critical period. Uh, you want people to experience the first stage of a true detoxification, that is on their own, they've separated for 30 days from the drug. That means they didn't necessarily separate from other elements of detoxification, like psychological cravings, thoughts, bad thinking, all that, they need time to separate from that too. So the, the issue of change is related to participation and so the, the big push always is to get people just to participate often even if they don't understand it you just do it now we've had you know uh, unfortunately over the years you get the way that they get practice may not be an optimal you can get a little abusive you can get a little uh, like tyrannical in talking to people and that's simply, those are mistakes that we think we've made over, over the years. We don't need those mistakes. The principle is this. We want you to participate. If you participate, you will see for yourself what happens. So look, it's a little quick characterization, as again, we're not training, we're teaching, but it's a quick characterization uh, in the community as method. A related issue on this now, that I want to be able to have time to talk, talk to you about, 
Well, there are two. We say use every element of the social, psychological, and physical environment in the therapeutic community. The physical, as, as a, a way of learning about yourself and changing. Physical environment is like this. Take an environment like this. We have in classical TCs, we've always had a physical environment that had a kind of uniform protocol. Signs talking about recovery, 12-step signs, people t talking about, uh, you know, if you participate, then you will change. Slogans, you know what I mean? Photographs of other people have changed. All of that was an intuitive understanding that even the physical environment, if we have right things up, it gives the individual the opportunity to be getting back something that could be useful to them. As ordinary as that might sound. But then there's another level of environment, like this environment, where you have a beautiful environment. And we are now, not only you want people to learn when they come into an environment like this, that they are, no matter what their lives have been and who they've been in terms of their identity, they are entitled to a beautiful environment, but only if they can maintain it. So this is potentially a very powerful change-oriented strategy. I call it a therapeutic intervention, you know, in terms of the inner environment. It's powerful, it's silent, you don't have to essentially keep redoing it. What you're asking people to do is recognize that it's beautiful, but, and you're entitled to it, but you have to maintain it. Now you're talking to populations that never maintained anything, right? That people who have had great problems in their responsibility levels and accountability levels, teaching them to watch every ashtray, watch every chip. When we had TCs making sure that people cleaned up the ashtrays and moved things around, all of that, was to essentially encourage the message of, this is your environment, this is your life, you make it as good as you can, you keep it as clean as you can, and it's related to a lot of, a lot of issues, you know, clean head, clean bed, all, this, all these things. It's no minor matter, but it's silent. It's an ongoing intervention, you understand? And so if you see a room that's in disarray and has been essentially ignored, you know that there's something wrong in the program. No minor matter how we can call a general meeting on this, the way this house has looked. Are you with me on this? I mean, it's okay. yeah. that's the physical environment. The issue in a community is method approach, where individuals are uh, uh, committed to utilizing each other in both individual and group formats, community formats, that is, it's a distinction between community and group. Community is the entire, uh, is the entire aggregate of people. A meeting, the word meeting, morning meeting, you use the word gathering, that's a difference. There is a difference, <coughs> gathering and a meeting. But uh, in the classical theses, they'll use the word meeting. You don't hear the word gathering that much, but meeting. Yeah? Yeah, 80% right. of everybody that we see out of our 3,000 something people are people of color. So we're trying to really keep looking at language in terms of how Walmart white is it and how inclusive is it. Yeah. The classical three meetings in a, in a classical TC program, the morning meeting, the seminar in the middle of the day, the reason why it's a seminar, but it's a meeting because it's, it's a collection of the whole community. Meetings are collections of the whole community. Groups are collections of subsets of the community. When, when you run a group, that's 15 people. When you run a meeting, I'm, I would have the whole community. It's a, it's a, I, I fuss about these distinctions, you know what I mean? So you can take it or leave it for what it's, what it's worth. But, but I, it, it does get to me when everybody keeps on group, next group, and they really mean that they again, it's another meeting, they're calling it a group. I want to make one comment to, particularly to faculty, um, special faculty, correctional staff. In a classical TC approach, community as method, because it's so grounded in the, the students and, and themselves, the role of staff is a, and this is a training issue, but I want to at least leave you with a very important message. You say, well, what's the role of staff? What's the role of counselors? What's the role of the correctional officers and so on? In, in an approach which essentially is the community is the method. What's the role of the staff? Well, one of the reasons I do this work and even do a teaching like this 
is try, I try to convey to all forms of staff, whether they're faculty, whether they're correctional staff, that there is a distinctive and profound role that you play, but it's not the one that you have conventionally been trained on. As you come out of it, essentially, your training is either if it's in corrections, it's to maintain the safety and so on, and security. If it's, if it's in human services, it's basically to do counseling and so on. But I want you to understand something, that you can take on a much different role in a therapeutic community, once you understand community as method and what's supposed to be working in there, then your role as staff is to facilitate community as methods. It's not to essentially substitute for community as method, it's to facilitate it. Now I realize it's we're in the last five minutes and that, this is a much, much longer issue to talk about. What is the staff role? as facilitator, and that brings up all of the issues that, you know, how do you use yourself effectively in a, in a therapeutic community oriented or community as, or, uh, as method oriented program. You have a powerful role to play, it's just very different than the one you've been trained on. And so that, and, and I'm giving you the message of that difference. So the human services person really is you facilitate community as method. For the correctional officers involved, they have served in very profoundly great ways in prison TCs. When correctional officers began to understand that a well-run therapeutic community, even in the prison, is capable of managing many of the safety and security issues on, on its own behavioral strength to do that. But that program had to really demonstrate that it could do that. Otherwise, the, the correctional position was correct in saying, well, maybe there's, it's, it's not safe. Maybe we've got to step in too much. So the balance between uh, a program which is really well run enough to manage most, if nearly all of its behavioral issues, that balance and the correctional office beginning to get confidence and trust that that program can do that, that usually is the optimal marriage between the two when we begin to see great outcomes. We had great correctional officers who went on to advance the therapeutic community in prison over these years. From what they learned, they started out as correctional officers, then get, they could become counselors and so on, but uh, they saw the potential for this. But programs, if they're not at their top level, if they can't demonstrate they can really manage that, then you're gonna get a, a lot more intrusion from the correctional system and you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna lose some of your autonomy doing that. So there's a great role for the correctional officers and when they understand community's method and believe and have trust that it will work. <laughs>